So let's do that. All right, Bill, I'm just gonna put you on the spotlight here for a second so everyone can see you. Hey, Bill. Welcome. Can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. All right. Hey, I'm curious, uh, as we go through the evening, um, everyone will be on mute. Can you unmute them if they need to ask questions? They want to yeah, that's a good question. Actually, Zoom yeah. is limiting my ability to do that. Um, so everyone, just oh. make sure you know where the mute button is on the uh, okay. bottom left of your screen. Thanks for pointing that out, Bill. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, if, if, I, if you raise your hand and I'm not hearing you, or if you have just want to jump in with a quick question, go ahead and do it. Unmute yourself and yeah. jump in. Um, but yeah, great. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. No, no problem. Um, all right, so um, to get to introducing Bill Staples Jr., I guess. Um, Bill is joining us from Chandler, Arizona, where he lives with his wife and, and two children. Uh, he's born in Troy, New York, raised in Plano, Texas, a self-described uh, Yankee Texan living in the desert. <laughs> um, studied advertising and journalism at the University of North Texas and uh, earned his MBA from Arizona State University. Uh, his day job is marketing communications in the IT healthcare industry. Um, but of course, the reason he is here is that he is a baseball author and historian. Um, he claims to have inherited the baseball bug from his great grandfather, Merritt Corbett, who played uh, professionally over 100 years ago and played against many of the great Negro League stars of the day of the you know, first decade or so of the 1900s. Um, of course, he's the author of Gentle Black Giants, the subject of today's talk, uh, but he's also the author of Ken uh, Kenichi Zanimura, Japanese American baseball pioneer. Uh, which is the winner of the 2012 Saber Baseball Research Award. Uh, speaking of Saber, he is the chairman of the Saber Asian Baseball Committee, which I believe was founded by Rob Fitz, who's on the call with us today. Uh, so he's continuing Rob's legacy there. Um, he's also, uh, Bill's also a board member of the Nisei Baseball Research Project, uh, the Arizona chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, um, a research contributor to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, uh, and he's presented at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, amongst other places. Um, really, so Bill offers his time, persistence, research expertise, and knowledge to many national and local projects that benefit his local community and the greater Japanese American and African American communities. So for those, um, we thank you, and we also thank you for spending time with us tonight, Bill. All right. So can I go ahead and just uh, share my screen? And yeah, can... yeah. Go ahead, jump into okay. it, share your screen, and great. Do it. Uh oh, you you disabled my screen. Yeah. Share. <laughs> okay. I got you. Hey, while we work through that, uh, just to give an overview of the evening. So we, I believe, we have ninety minutes, maybe eighty minutes now, or seventy, somewhere in there. So I was going to give the twenty-minute presentation, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Uh, but I'd like to give 10 minutes or so to my time to a guest who doesn't know that I'm going to invite him to speak, uh, just because Ralph Pierce is with us tonight. And Ralph contributed a great uh, section on Jimmy Bonner, first African-American to play over in Japan. So I thought that, or at least professionally, to sign a contract. So if he has some time, if he'd like to share, we can spend five to 10 minutes on Jimmy Bonner. So Ralph, just want to give you some uh, kudos and recognition since you're here. Yeah, that'd be great. And okay. thank you all for joining us. Yeah. Go, Ralph. Okay. You should be able to share now. Sorry about that. I think it must have oh, no problem. Back oh. to it. Wrong button. All righty. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, looking good to me. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, so we are here to celebrate the Negro League Centennial, and I'm going to talk about General Black Giants, a history of Negro Leaguers in Japan. Um, so with that, uh, just an overview of what we're going to cover. I want to provide a, a background of uh, kind of the inspiration for this book and how I got involved, and also my interest in Japanese baseball and Japanese American baseball and Negro League history. I want to talk about the process that I went through to develop the book because it was a team effort. 
And then I'm going to share some highlights because I imagine not everybody purchased the book. So I'll share uh, probably about three or four pretty cool highlights, I think, uh, from the book, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of my background. Um, as Shane mentioned, I'm the author of two books. The first one is Kenichi Zenimura, Japanese American Baseball Pioneer. And it's about Kenichi Zenimura, uh, who I met kind of virtually when I moved to Chandler in 2004. So I live right next door to the Gila River Indian Reservation, the Gila River Indian community. And I'm a youth baseball coach and I was in Texas before I moved here to Arizona. And I thought it'd be great to give to the community and coach uh, on the reservation. So I did a search for Gila River in baseball. Nothing popped up with regards to coaching opportunities, but all this great information from the Nisei Baseball Research Project about Kenichi Zenimura and his great career. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I thought I knew a lot about baseball history, uh, but I didn't know anything about Japanese American history. And it reminded me a lot of the Negro League uh, story and that these were uh, great ball players who were forced to play in leagues of their own because of the discrimination and racism of the era in which they grew or was, uh, lived in. So uh, in a sense, my joke is that uh, Kenichi Zenimura is my Star Wars and General Black Giants is my uh, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, it's an extension, it's part two of this story because Zenimura influenced the tours of the General Black Giants or the Philadelphia Royal Giants uh, because of his relationship with the team in the 1920s. So it does all start with uh, Zenny, was his nickname, and his relationship with Lon Goodwin. So Lon Goodwin was the manager of the Philadelphia Royal Giants. Uh, he's from Austin, Texas. And again, because I was raised in Texas, uh, there's a lot of cool Texas connections that I'll point out. Uh, but he was born in Austin, Texas in about 1879 moved to uh, California. And his story is really important because not a whole lot of recognition is given to West Coast uh, Negro League Baseball. And Lon Goodwin's a very important figure in West Coast Black baseball history. He was a teammate of Rube Foster's with the Waco Yellow Jackets in like the 1890s. And uh, around 1920, he actually signed a Japanese American to play on his all black team, uh, which is pretty rare. Uh, but there was some marketing involved as well because he was trying to draw the Japanese American community to come uh, buy tickets and watch his team play. Uh, so in 1925, Zenimura competes against Lon Goodwin's team called the LA White Sox. Uh, that's the first time they play Zenny's team, the Fresno Athletic Club. They win uh, by six to five by one run, surprise everybody. The next year, they have a, uh, a rematch. It's a doubleheader, 4th of July weekend, 1926. Oh, and one thing I should mention, Zenny had already had his first tour to, to Japan in 1924. So he was well-connected in Japan. And one of his important uh, partners, if you will, in arranging baseball tours is now in Japan uh, attending uh, Meiji University. Uh, his name is Frank Narashima or his Japanese name was Takizo Matsumoto. So um, anyway, 1926, Zenimura spends a weekend with the LA White Sox. They have a double header. Zenimura's teams win both of those. But by December, the LA White Sox are invited to come and compete in Japan. Uh, that's a, an important distinction because the LA White Sox were invited, but it's the Philadelphia Royal Giants who end up going. Lon Goodwin changed the name of his team 19, uh, late 1925-26, and he took his California Winter League team, if you will, to, uh, to Japan. So that's the Zenimura connection in terms of the LA White Sox and the invitation to go to Japan. Bill, do you know why he yeah. called them the Philadelphia Royal Giants? Well, uh, on paper, they were a stronger team. So I think from a marketing standpoint, he probably could have had a better draw. His intent was to actually take the entire uh, California Winter League roster, which were all really the, the top all-stars of the Negro Leaguers who went to the West Coast to compete. Uh, Turkey Stearns was a part of that lineup. Uh, maybe Bullet Joe Rogan in the 1927 team. Some really top-notch names, but only four of the, those players ended up going. Uh, Biz Mackey, Rap Dixon, Frank Duncan, 
and uh, who's the other one? It'll come to me as we go through, but only four of them ended up going. Oh, and Andy Cooper. Uh, and all four of them ended up getting in trouble, if you will, with the uh, Negro League officials because they skipped their contract and showed up about halfway through the season. They were supposed to be ba uh, banned for the entire season. They ended up paying 100 or $200 and just kept playing. So they had a lot of uh, weight, if you will, and uh, they wanted to get paid and they made more money in Japan than they would have if they stayed in the US. So for a moment. So this is the original cover of Gentle Black Giants published in 1985 by Kao Sayama. And this is the, the new cover, but I wanted to talk about this photograph here. I joked with Rob that this was Biz Mackey and some unknown Japanese ball player. Uh, so around 2006, I get into this research and I'm working with the Negro League Baseball Museum and they send me this photograph because Rob, I believe they purchased uh, one of the magazines that was for auction at the time. So they were trying to figure out who it was on the cover. So working with uh, Professor Kyoko Yoshido over in Japan, we went through this kind of photo search and tried to match it up. And we identified that it was O'Neill Pullen, who's kind of an unknown Negro leaguer from Texas, Beaumont, Texas, and a Hall of Famer from Japan, Shinji Hamasaki. So we kind of got the story right, that it was an unknown player and a Hall of Famer, but it was the other way around. Uh, so we'll talk more about Hamasaki as we go through uh, telling this story. All right, so Kaz is not with us tonight, so I thought I'd take some time and introduce him to those who may not know him. Huge baseball fan. Uh, he attended baseball fantasy camps, actually a lot like I did. Uh, I spent a five-year career going to Florida uh, and playing ball there and had a great time, but my eyes are fading and can't see the ball moving anymore. But um, so who, he's gonna be 85 this year. And as you can see from this slide, uh, his favorite sports are baseball and swimming. And his goal in life is to write good stories, <laughs> which is a great goal. Uh, and he, he does do that. And he did that with uh, Gentle Black Giants. So I wanna give the background of how he became inspired uh, by this story. So he was a Sabre member in 1983. He traveled all the way from Japan to attend the Sabre Conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, he's good friends with uh, Clifford Kekline, I believe his name. He was the uh, librarian with the Baseball Hall of Fame up in the top there. And Clifford introduced him to John Hallway, who's one of the top Negro League historians at the time and still is, he's well respected. And John approaches Kaz and says, hey, I need, to, I need you to tell me as much as you can about the Kansas City Monarchs going to Japan in the 1920s. So in John's mind, he thinks it's the Kansas City Monarchs because it's Frank Duncan and Andy Cooper who played for them. Uh, but it wasn't the Monarchs that went. We now know it was the Royal Giants. Kaz was kind of like me. He thought he knew everything about baseball history in Japan, but didn't know anything about Negro Leaguers going to Japan. He only knew about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and those famous Major League tours. Uh, so he, he gets the bug. He's, he's got the passion to really research this story. And my joke is that he kind of reminds me of Ray Kinsella uh, in Field of Dreams. So I envision him like with this passion, doing all this research, trying to find out all he can about uh, these players. So he interviews all the former players, or not all of them, some of them. He goes to nursing homes, uh, talks with some of the old players and umpires who had played against the Royal Giants. He goes to the Hall of Fame unearths a lot of research, goes to the archives. Then he gets on a plane and he travels to the US, goes to the Hall of Fame here, interviews Roy Campanella, Monty Irvin, Leon Day, anybody who played with Biz Mackey. His Biz, is, he's been he passed 20 years ago. And then he learns that Phil Dixon has Bullet Joe Rogan's uh, passport. And so he's got to go visit Phil Dixon, uh, which is kind of a pretty interesting story there. So. And this is just one of uh, Phil's books here on uh, Bullet Rogan. Uh, so it's a really cool story. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to share that. But years later, as, actually as we were finishing this book, Kaz tells me, oh, I'll get to the next slide. Uh, Kaz publishes his book in 1985 and he publishes just an, an article in uh, Sabre's baseball research. And it was called, their throws were like arrows. And it introduces 
uh, the Royal Giants to English speaking and English reading baseball audience. But years later, Cobbs tells me as we're finishing the story, the true inspiration as to why he really wanted to write it. So he tells the story of when he was a kid. He said, when World War II ended, I was a third grader in Wakayama City. American soldiers soon arrived and they were especially kind to us kids. I later learned that they were members of the all black 93rd Infantry Division of the US Army. And like us, they loved baseball and some even coached and umpired our games. And one day one of the soldiers said to me, someday you'll be a great pitcher. Sadly, I never did fulfill his prophecy, but his encouragement fueled my love for the game and I became a baseball writer instead. So General Black Giants is my thank you letter to that soldier. So it came from the heart cause uh, and why he wrote this. And one of the things that I really liked about when he, when he told me this, uh, two things, the 93rd Infantry, they trained at Fort Huachuca here in Arizona. So it's probably just three miles from my home right now. And they played ball in the 1940s on Rube Foster Field. It's probably the only ball field that was named after Rube Foster. And it was in the middle of the Arizona desert, uh, well, down near the border. Uh, so it's kind of cool that it kind of comes full circle and especially nice that we're celebrating the Negro League Centennial uh, with Rube Foster and what he did. So, so now I want to share my personal connection. Uh, this is me and my family. And that's my mother-in-law over on the far right. Her name is Dorothy Ross Newman. So. Uh, her great uncle is Robert Bailey, and he played in the Texas Negro Leagues. Uh, and he played in, in the 1919 Texas Negro League Championship. O'Neill Pullen was his teammate playing catcher. Bob Bailey's playing second base. Will Ross is the pitcher. And Biz Mackey's playing on the other team with the San Antonio Black Aces, uh, normally the Black Broncos. This year, all the teams changed their name to honor the returning troops. So they're all military names. Uh, and Dorothy, before she passed, she asked me to try to write Bob Bailey's story, but there's very little out there on Bob Bailey. So this is, in a way, my personal attempt to kind of pay tribute to him and the Texas Negro Leaguers and all of his teammates and what they did and the impact they had uh, on baseball over in Japan as well. So I just wanted to share that. And finally, uh, one of my favorite ball players, and maybe everyone here who loves Japanese baseball, Sadahura. He says, my baseball career was a long, long invitation, or excuse me, initiation into a single secret that at the heart of all things is love. Um, and so his, I think of his relationship with Hank Aaron, and it also reminds me of the spirit in which the General Black Giants uh, approach their games with the Japanese ball players. And in that same spirit, uh, I wanted to help bring this uh, book to English audiences. So anyway, so that's the background and the inspiration. So now I would just want to talk about how I got to know Cos just quickly. Uh, 2011, I'm doing a little book tour here in Arizona. I meet Perry Barber, uh, umpire, and she buys two copies of my book, one for her and one for some guy in Japan named Kaz Sayama. And um, so he gets my book and we start connecting. And he's doing some research on the 1935 Nipponese or Japanese All-Stars who play in the Wichita tournament in Wichita, Kansas. So it's Kenso Nishida and some other all-stars from Northern California. So I help him do the research and he's thankful. So he sends me a copy of his book, Gentle Black Giants. And all I could do is look at it and salivate. I couldn't read it. Uh, I can't read Japanese kanji and I can't speak it. I know some basic uh, terms, but I really wanted to know what was in this book and other historians around me were saying, gotta be really great if somebody could translate it. Uh, so after a few failed efforts of trying to get volunteers to do it, I realized you've got to pay some people some money to do it. So I did a little fundraising in the local Arizona Japanese American community. We were able to raise some money for the translation project. So the Japanese American Citizens League, the Nisei Baseball Research Project, and the Japanese business community here in Arizona helped fund the translation. So in turn, this book is really kind of a fundraiser for these two nonprofits and the Negro League Baseball Museum for any of the research we do for them. And what's kind of cool about the Japanese American community being involved is that historically, they've always played an important role in, in building that bridge, if you will, between the US and Japan. 
So in the 1927 tour, we have George Ire, who played an important role as the, the translator and the, uh, the organizer, if you will, for everything uh, for the team over in Japan. And then in 1932-33, we have Steer Noda from Hawaii, who serves as in that same role, translator and uh, interpreter. Uh, he's very interesting because in the 1950s, he eventually becomes an important politician and he helps with uh, the statehood of Hawaii. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he may have been one of the first representatives from Hawaii as well. All right, quickly go through the process that uh, we went through. I hired two translators, uh, Shimaku Shimizu here in, in Phoenix. She helped with the original Japanese to English translation. I served as the editor, cleaned it up. And then I had another Japanese uh, reader translate it back to the book to compare. And then from there, we cleaned it up, had Gary Ashwell, uh, great Negro League historian, great editor as well, and Kerio Nakagawa, proof it, check it. And then we worked with uh, the Nisei Baseball Research Project to develop it. All right, just a few uh, editorial decisions that we had to make along the way. This great article from 1986, I believe it was, that Kaz wrote, that kind of serves as, as the model for his English voice. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted uh, English readers to be reminded that they're reading the perspective of, of a Japanese author. So we kept the Japanese years uh, in relationship to uh, uh, the emperor years, if you will, uh, Showa 2, 1927, Showa 9, 1934. So as you'll read, you'll see those. Uh, and then there was, for my comfort uh, and preference, there was an excessive amount of just the phrase, the black team. The black team did this, the black team did that. And so they had a name, it's the Royal Giants. So that was my decision to mix it up and to make it a little bit easier for our 21st century ears and eyes uh, when reading it. All right. So basically what the project ended up being is two books in one. The first part is the English translation to Sayama's General Black Giants. And then the second part is a history of Negro leaders in Japan, which is really, as Rob was saying early on, uh, great appendices of uh, a tour scrapbook, newspaper clippings, photos, maps, a lot of stats. Actually, Appendix A is a list of every tour between the US and Japan from 1905 to 2019, all different levels, college, high school, semi-pro, professional, et cetera. Uh, when I say all, we'll put an asterisk by that. I'm sure we probably missed a few, but we've got control of the press and we'll update it where we need to. Uh, so when stats were available, we included that, player bios, and then all these great articles from other historians who've done work on African-Americans over in Japan. Dexter Thomas, Ralph Pierce, who's with us tonight, Kyoko Yoshido, and Bob Luke wrote a great biography on Biz Mackey. So Rob, you leaning in, so you wanna share something or you good? Okay, all right. So just to be a pain in the ass, huh? I, found, I found a tour you missed a few minutes ago. Oh, perfect. See you about it later. <laughs> we'll, up, we'll update, okay. All righty. <laughs> okay. Was it, are you talking about the Japan ball tours you missed? You, you didn't put those in there. <laughs> Tell you what, you guys want to sponsor the book going forward. There you we'll, go. <laughs> we'll get the price down to $9.99 for everyone. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So then it came time for the forward. Uh, Don Wakamatsu wrote the first one for Kenichi Zanimura. Thought it'd be nice to have a major league manager with some personal connections. Reached out to Dave Roberts and his team. His mother is from Japan. His father is African-American from Texas. Uh, he passed. Uh, then I thought it'd be interesting to have uh, Kunigasa in Japan, the Iron Man of Japan. Uh, but that was, there were a lot of hoops involved and unfortunately he was not well by the time we got there and he passed, uh, passed away in 2018. And then I realized I had an obvious choice uh, right on my speed dial, if you will. I, I call Kenzo Zenimura about once a month uh, since 2006, 2007. He was born in 1927 during the first tour. Uh, I'm gonna share something really interesting here. Uh, and then in the 1930s, he grew up in Fresno, California, watching these guys play on the West Coast when they would come to his dad's ballpark, the Japanese ballpark in Fresno. Um, so 
anyway, I reached out to Kez, uh, Kenso. Oh, here's the other cool thing I wanted to share. Kenso Zenimura is the second name to the end. Um, he's on the same passenger ship in the summer of 1928 with O'Neill Poland, basically the whole team going to Hawaii. So the Zenimura family is going to Hawaii at the same time. They're on the same ship together with uh, O'Neill Poland's summer team going to, going to Hawaii. Um, so anyway, I reached out to Kenso and he wrote it. And uh, I'm glad that he did because sadly he passed in December of 2018. So it's a nice way to remember him and his connections. A really uh, just interesting side note, he helped build Zenimura Field here in the internment camps. And he got out of uh, the camps in 1945, the summer of 45. He moves to Chicago to live with his uncle and they go to the Negro League All-Star game at Comiskey Park. And he got to see Jackie Robinson playing second base for the Kansas City Monarchs in that game. Uh, it was one of the highlights of his young career. Uh, he would later go on and be one of the first uh, three Americans to play for the Hiroshima Carp. Him and his brother Kenshi and Ben Mitsuyushi, all from the Fresno or Central California area. All right. So the book title is A History of Negro, Negro Leaguers in Japan, but it's actually a misnomer because it's really in Asia and in the Pacific, because it's more than just Japan but that would have been too much for the title. Uh, so it's Japan, it's Korea, it's China, it's the Philippines, and it's the Hawaiian territories, which it was referred to during the 20s and 30s. There's so much confusion prior to us sitting down and really buttoning things up about when they went, where they were during certain years. So that was the goal in, in this project as well, is to know uh, exactly which tours, when they started, when they ended, how many games they played, uh, where the dates, of course, uh, how far they traveled, etc. cetera. Uh, and at the end of the book is a compilation. So we, we recognize, <clears throat> excuse me. We recognize six tours, three of them to Japan and China and Korea, and then three to Hawaii only. So 1927 is Japan uh, in Korea and China. 28, 29, and 31 are only the Hawaiian territories. That may not seem that important, but it was actually a middle ground and a meeting place for teams from Japan. So when we talk about building this bridge to, to the Pacific, that was a very important midpoint, if you will, in that relationship. And then the, the winner, or yeah, the winner of 32, 33, then 33, 34, were the more extensive tours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we just, again, I added it all up and the total of number of players, 44 players, one manager, and the two promoters that I mentioned. All right. So a couple of things that I learned along the way. Um, there's this concept in the, uh, at least in the Japanese American community, I believe it's consistent in the Japanese community as well, Hone and Tatame, uh, the inner truth and the outer face. So keeping harmony within the relationships is very important uh, in these communities. And I found that perhaps uh, a lot of what was shared about historically the, the tours uh, was kind of the outer face, trying to maintain harmony. And as we were translating uh, Sayama's book, I realized we were starting to see some inner truth that these Japanese ball players were starting to share their experiences and observations about the attitudes, the behaviors, uh, and comparing and contrasting the black teams with the all white teams. And it was very uh, eye opening. So I'm going to share some of that uh, with you here. Yeah. So, chapter 17 of Causes of Gentle Black Giants, he has a really interesting comparison of Team A and Team B. And Team A is the All Americans, and Team B is the Royal Giants. And um, so we put it into more of a table format here, but in the text, it's pretty consistent with how he had laid it out. So everybody knows about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and the All-Americans. They played 34 games. Kaz recognized that the Royal Giants played 48 games. Uh, they were well-known white players uh, compared to the unknown black players. Uh, Team A, they were sponsored by uh, the local or the newspaper there in Japan whereas the Royal Giants, they were self-funded. 
the All-Americans arrived with this attitude of, hey, we're the experts. We're going to show you how to play. And whereas the uh, General Black Giants, they said, uh, we are friends. Let's play ball together. Um, there are stories of uh, times where the uh, All-Americans changed the, the calls or uh, ignored what the umpires were saying in Japan, whereas the Black players were very respectful to the umpires, uh, bowing uh, in certain situations as well. All Americans ran up the score. Um, the Royal Giants kept the games very close. After the games, the Japanese players were very disappointed and frustrated, and some of them said they were going to quit. Uh, whereas with the Royal Giants, after the games, the Japanese players gained confidence uh, in their skills. The All Americans returned to Japan. Some of them were disappointed with their experiences, whereas the Royal Giants, they loved being in Japan. In fact, they were treated, treated like kings in Japan compared to how they were treated here in the US. And then Kaz's final point is that we've heard so much about the All-Americans and from his perspective, and he was the first one to, to basically unearth this, nothing has been said about them for uh, half a century or for 50 years. And again, this is 1985 when he first found this. So a really uh, interesting and an insightful compare and contrast between the two tours Again, from the perspective of the Japanese players and the umpires and those who are involved. Bill, I have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so, I mean, and the book very clearly points out how, you know, culturally and, and based on the hospitality, like why the Royal Giants um, were so respectful as guests and, and how they appreciated um, their reception and, and it was a pretty mutual feeling. But also yeah. mentions and you allude to it here, like the financial aspect and the business incentive to behave in a way that was far different than the American players would have, uh, or sorry, than the uh, major league players behaved. So like, how much yeah. of that is business influence, and how much of that is cultural influence? Um, well, this is just me guessing. Yeah. Um, there was some business influence as well. I mean, it's it's marketing. They want to maintain uh, good relations. They're relying on people coming out to the ballpark, being respectful to their guests. Um, I, if I had to guess, and I'll throw a percentage out. It's probably 80-20, uh, but for me, it's probably, I think it's the 80 of uh, doing the right thing and treating their guests with uh, respect, uh, but then being mindful that they're there to make money and pay for their trip. So that's my take. Other people may have uh, a different assessment, but. Baseball, uh, people are very opinionated. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah, no, I definitely got the impression that it was something like that. Yeah. But it's interesting to, you know, there's multiple incentives. It's interesting how they had to, they didn't have any guarantee of, of games in a lot of cases. So they had to make sure that they were uh, making a good impression. And it seems yeah. like they're extremely successful and savvy at that, but largely because it came so naturally and they were being yeah. good sports about it. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to play the Texas card here. And just knowing that actually the bulk of these players did come from Texas. Um, AJ Johnson, the pitcher, O'Neill Pullen, Biz Mackey, Andy Cooper. Um, I remember my wife and my mother in law saying, act like somebody loved you or raised you with love. Uh, so, so there could be some of that too, just the, yeah. their bringing and, and how they were raised and how, how they're you know, going to interact with their guests. So yeah. good Southern gentlemen, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so re that's an interesting question. And so how does that translate into uh, the dynamics in, in the game experience? So as I was doing the research and the writing for this book, I'm working with a trainer uh, whose background is a, in Aikido. And he starts sharing this concept with me called the Uke Nage relationship. And it's basically kind of this agreement between the sensei and, and the student that the, the teacher is not going to exert full force. They're not going to kick their butt so that the student can enjoy the learning process, stay encouraged, and still develop and learn and grow. And as I was thinking about that, and I also thought about when he said Aikido, I thought about um, Saduhuro and his relationship with his uh, master, if you will, in Japan, uh, Arakawa. Is that, I believe that's the right name, yeah, Eric Howe. Um, and I thought there was some of that dynamic as well from what I remember reading in his book, A Zen Way of Baseball. 
So I think that that uh, the spirit of that kind of relationship existed between the gentle black giants and the Japanese ball players that they competed against as well. Uh, and so that's uh, Kaz kind of refers to that in his. Uh, I can't read that there. I had to move something. Uh, in in the book, uh, he called them the shock absorbers. He said other countries rejected baseball because the visiting professionals left fledging of players disillusioned with the game through defeat. But we were lucky enough to have a chance to neutralize that shock. The Royal Giants visits were the shock absorber. So, and this is where the controversy comes in uh, because there's a lot of uh, generalizations about some of the things that Kaz says about the influence of the general black giants. Some people have read what Kaz has said and said that he inspired the start of pro baseball in Japan. Well, if you really get into the nuance of what he was saying, it was really about that dynamic and that relationship and developing the players, but really about the timing as well. So this quote right here um, uh, captures that. So baseball has in it many elements that appeal to the Japanese mind. And it may safely be said that professional baseball would have been born in the course of time without the visits of the generally inaccessible Royal Giants, however, I don't think it would have seen the light of day as early as 1936. So Kaz's argument is that it was the, the right people at the right time. Uh, the stars were aligning so that professional baseball could start uh, in the mid 1930s. Again, these tours in 1927, um, 31, 32, or excuse me, 32, 33, 34, okay? And so this is kind of my reconciliation with all of that. Uh, thinking about baseball as a business. And for any business to succeed, there's a certain supply and demand in economics. And there's no denying that the influence that the All-Americans had in building that excitement around professional baseball and the hunger for it, uh, I think that's where the All-American tours get a lot of credit for, uh, for their influence. But from the supply side, helping the players develop and encouraging them, so that they were in the right mindset, mindset had the right skill set to then start uh, professionally. I think some credit needs to be given to uh, the influence of uh, the Royal Giants as well. And so I just want to end with uh, kind of an overview of the skill level of these players. So it's a very interesting blend of Negro Leaguers and Cuban League ball players who are Hall of Fame caliber, Major League caliber. And then a mix of semi-pro players from California. So you had this wide range of being able to turn on the throttle and turn it down, which uh, allowed them to kind of control the score and keep things close, which is a really good formula for that dynamic. Unlike the All-Americans where it was, uh, Shane, like you referred to, the dream team of 92 in, in basketball. So the Hall of Famers who were involved, Bullet Joe Rogan's in the Hall, Andy Cooper, Biz Mackey, I personally think maybe Rap Dixon and Chet Brewer are the next two players to go in. And um, I've become very impressed with the career of Lon Goodwin throughout this process. Uh, I think he's very influential in terms of West Coast baseball, all the tours that he helped uh, inspire, influence, and arrange. Um, and you'll see, uh, I introduced this concept called Trans-Pacific Barnstorming. Just like the mainlanders who got in the bus and drove around the US, uh, these guys are barnstormers too, except they got on a, a ship and went all across the Pacific, which is really impressive. And again, Lon Goodwin's uh, tied with Andy Cooper when you look at the cumulative number of days on tour of the total tours. Uh, so again, very impressed with the role of Lon Goodwin. Uh, and I think uh, this is my prediction, probably I don't know, a couple decades, he'll get more recognition for uh, his influence. Uh, and then quickly, I'm gonna just uh, zip through some highlights. So it's very interesting when they first arrived, the Royal Giants, uh, the press accidentally referred to them as a Native American team. So uh, there's this postcard that was floating around, Indian baseball team visits in Tokyo, uh, which is very interesting because in 1921, there was a Native American team that visited uh, the, I think it's called the Suquamish tribe from Washington. And I just learned in preparing for this that one of the Indian pitchers killed the Japanese player with a curveball that didn't curve, uh, much like the Ray Chapman situation. So Rob, that may be a story you wanna look into. Okay. 
Uh, the other highlights, Rap Dixon really uh, put on a great exhibition of his skills. Uh, they would do contests running around the bases. So I wanted to offer some contemporary times, Billy Hamilton, Byron Buxton, D. Gordon, you can see them. So he's pretty uh, equivalent up there with uh, modern day ball players in terms of the speed around the bases. You know, 90 feet is 90 feet and 360 feet, et cetera. He also had a great arm. He could throw the ball from home plate. Uh, I think 420 feet center field, Koshian. So I really impressed everybody there. Biz Mackey uh, hit the first home run at Meiji Shrine Stadium. Uh, happened on April, April 20th, 1927. Uh, which by the way, that was the date that this book came out. I tried to match it up there in 2000. He also hit that ball off of the Fresno Athletic Club. Uh, so that was an interesting, it was kind of two American teams competing in Japan. Uh, during the 1932 tour, Biz Mackey, uh, forever the showman, uh, he played all nine positions in the game against the, uh, the Honolulu Asahi. Uh, started off at catcher, worked his way all the way up to relief pitcher. Uh, and I haven't been able to find uh, other Negro League box scores that have a player playing all nine positions. I know it's happened in the major leagues and you guys may know some of those players, but pretty impressive. Really shows the uh, multi-athletic ability of, of Biz Mackey. By the way, his great grandson played in the NFL. Uh, his name is Riley Odoms. He was a tight end for the uh, Denver Broncos. Uh, his real name is Riley Mackey. And so Riley Odoms has his grandfather's nickname or name, excuse me. Hey, Bill. Yes. Uh, Eureka Gamma Remmer has got a question for you. Eureka, okay. You want us? Eureka, you want to just take yourself off of mute and ask him? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Am I, cool. am I visible? Yeah. Yep. We can hear you. Hey, Eureka. Hey. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks. Um, so I want to back up a little bit. You were talking about the, the reception of the Negro League teams in Japan versus yes. the, the All-Star. Um, the, yeah, the All-Americans, yeah. Um, and, you know, Japan is not really known for its open-mindedness about uh, Negroes or Black people or whatever you call yeah. that. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of curious what you think about the the certain the fact that that they were received so well i mean i think there there is a kind of hero worship thing about people who perform that well and i i saw that comment mm -hmm. about the 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 babe ruth tour and i know that as much as japan would have loved to be to be the team with the all-star team with babe ruth on it i think they wanted to see him hit the home runs more than they wanted to to beat the team yeah and and so as far as the Negro League teams, when they went to Japan, you know, these are people that that didn't like live like a very accepted existence in the United States. And so yeah. like, I wonder if by being treated so well in terms of the hero worship part of being baseball stars, they were they they had a unique experience you know i mean i i'm not oh, taking yeah. away from them the sort of cultural thing of being southern gentlemen but sure sure to yeah. have a completely different experience and i don't know how much of that came up in your research but well it, again there's a very interesting blend of ball players i would actually call a lot of them the semi-pro players in california uh white collar players so A.J. Johnson, who was a pitcher, he went on to become one of the first African-American lieutenants in the LAPD. John Riddle, uh, he studied architecture at USC. Uh, he was one of the first African-American running backs to play in the Rose Bowl in 1926. Uh, and so he went on and he had a spectacular career in semi-pro football and in, as an architect. So it's an interesting blend because most people think of Negro League players as kind of blue collar players as well. But um, that dynamic, I think, was balanced by some of those players from California. So I, I think just their own personalities and their backgrounds, some of them are well-educated and professionals, um, 
I think that was important. Uh, they didn't act like ball players; they acted professional, if you will. And I think that carried over. Now, another thing that I think is very interesting on page 44 of the book, this is probably one of the coolest things that came across in the translation. One of the Japanese ball players says, I can't remember the, the name of the, the black player who said it, but he said to me, he said, if a war ever took place between the US and Japan, we would cheer for you. The black player saying we'd cheer for Japan. And to the, to the Japanese ball player, he was saying, when they said that, they were saying, we are a colored race too. Uh, they kind of felt like this, this kinship. Uh, so one, that's kind of an eerie prediction, 14 years before the war, to yeah. say they went to war, that they would root for Japan. Um, but I think it maybe speaks to kind of the, the, the relationship between the two of them. Rob, did you have something to air, Pat? Yeah, I don't know how to use the, uh, the, the digital hand up, so I'll just wave. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, that works. <laughs> so there's a whole literature out there that I discovered when I was writing my last book um, about uh, political connections between African Americans, disenfranchised African Americans in the US and Japan during yeah. World War II. And so there's a lot going on politically there. Um, so all I can say is that's really complicated. And yeah. whether it's because of the, the Japanese players' perception of things, that particular player's political perception, um, that of course was not completely shared by everybody, which is pretty obvious. But yeah. uh, just something to explore someday. Uh, we can talk about some other time and give you some pretty cool sources. Yeah. So W.E.B. Du Bois, he traveled to Japan. Uh, very important experience for him. Uh, there is just a fascination with African American culture in Japan. The John Coltrane Museum is in somewhere in Japan. Uh, and Dexter Thomas, uh, who wrote one of the uh, chapters in the appendices, that's what he studies over in Japan. Uh, kind of hip hop culture fascination uh, in, in the Japanese community. Yeah. I think there's a harder time with, with accepting the people who, who live there and are yeah. Well, uh, I, I can speak also maybe a little bit of personal experience. My wife's family uh, were military based in Tokyo uh, and they lived there for four years during the Olympics, the 64 games, I think it was. Uh, and their experiences were wonderful. So they, maybe it's because they were military, I'm not sure, but they, they only said, had wonderful things to say about how they were treated there. All right. Uh, and then one of the final highlights I wanted to share, uh, this was an unexpected discovery. Uh, during one of the summer tours of the Royal Giants going from LA to uh, Hawaii to compete against both uh, Nisei or Nikkei teams, Japanese American uh, and teams from Japan, uh, I discovered a guy named Subio Gonzalez and he had played for the Boston Red Sox in 1918. And here he is now, he's a Cuban ball player He's playing with the Royal Giants. That's him standing next to Andy Cooper. Uh, and it's one of the few rare cases of a major league ball player making the move back to or going to the Negro Leagues. Normally throughout history, it's a Negro Leaguer going to the major leagues. Uh, so I just wanted to share this because I think there's maybe a, a small handful of, of this occurring. So just an interesting story about the Royal Giants there. So with that, that's kind of a few highlights I want to share. I have a few just in notes, not slides, if you guys want to hear more. But so we just open it up and start talking. Uh, if you guys have any questions about anything I share. Thanks for that, Bill. That was, that was there's lots of fascinating stuff there. It's like yeah, so many rabbit holes and nuggets. That you I know, yeah. So that's that's I'm prepared stuff. to go Thanks. as deep as you want. Oh, and also again, let's not forget Ralph. Uh, I was going to mention uh, Harry Kono. Um, he was a good friend of Zenimira's. They He was part of the 1937, he arranged the 1937 tour uh, for, it was actually called the uh, Kono Alameda All-Stars. Zenimira was a coach with him. But Harry Kono uh, signed, correct me if I'm wrong, Ralph, the first contract with Jimmy Bonner. Are you there? Shane, does he have uh, the freedom to talk? Yeah. Uh, 
We can hear you barely. Oh, yeah, I have old technology here. There we go. We can hear you now. Uh -uh. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Are you on uh, AOL? <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay. It's just old school equipment here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, uh, Jimmy was, uh, Harry's first, I, I, well, I don't know if anybody else did, did Harry, uh, did Harry sign, so Jimmy may have been the only first and only, mm. or I know. Okay. All right. Well, it was, that, that was actually a little rough to hear, but I, it was pretty faint, but. Anyway, uh, in chapter, uh, let's find out what chapter it is. On page 211 of the book, if you should buy the book, a, a great uh, essay or entry from Ralph on Jimmy Bonner's uh, career in Japan, uh, who was from Louisiana, I believe, originally. All right. Hey, Bill, can you end the um, screen share so we can see each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, stop sharing. All right. Um, I missed all these comments because I couldn't see them. Is there anything? No worries. Well, the good one is that Leon pointed out that another guy that played all nine positions is Will Farrell did oh. it in spring training. <laughs> hey, Leon, were you there? Did you see any of it? No. I was there for the first two uh, positions he played. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fun. But, yeah, I saw him play the, yeah. the documentary they made was really good. They did a good job with that. Yeah. And, and Leon said like Cesar, Tovar, stop in second base. Yeah. Cesar Tovar and Bert Campanaris, the two other, yeah. and, and Andrew Romine, who pointed out, um, did it with the Tigers. Um, all right, well, if anyone has questions, go ahead, raise your hand, and, and we'll get to you, or you know, or otherwise, let us know you have a question. But yeah. uh, I have a number of questions, so I'll... Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll... I'm, I'm curious. If I don't have an answer, I'll BS. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I will say I don't know. Uh, I will defer to some of the experts here and, and we'll find an answer for you. Um, so I think you maybe you mentioned this with the kind of interface and outer face, but so yeah. in the in the you mentioned how up until Kaz published his book, all of the documentation of the US tours was done from more of a Western perspective um, in the yeah. English language. Uh, so what what was it that made his perspective unique and, and why was it important to have this different perspective? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, just like what I shared with the Hone Tatame, I think hearing uh, those experiences from the Japanese ballplayers themselves, that I think that was missing the entire time. Yeah. Uh, but it's also fascinating, I think, uh, and then I'm sorry, uh, some of the uh, the hidden gems from the black ball players themselves that were in the Japanese press. There's a wonderful long letter that Lon Goodwin wrote to one of the Japanese newspapers. Uh, we didn't find that until Kaz shared it as well. So he was actually sharing more of the Negro League perspective. There was some of that in the black newspapers, um, the Defender, the Courier, um, but not, not to the degree that they were available in, in the Japanese press. Um, what was the other thing I want to share? The, um, repeat, the, repeat, repeat the question one more time. Just the importance of, of hearing the story from the, yeah. from the Japanese perspective as opposed to all the traditional perspectives. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and I, again, it, it's important that all voices are heard when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's basically the perfect example of history in general, that it's always been kind of the white male perspective. And I can say that as a white male, um, that it's important to hear other voices. So in a way, I, and I know I am a white male working on this type of project. Rob has another white male comment. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Rob. You're muted. Yeah, I can't hear you. Um, so this is a, to me, it's kind of obvious. I think actually what you're really looking at is the perspective from the players against the perspectives of the management and the fans So from the players. Now what Kaz did, and I'm just like realizing this, this moment, so thank okay. you. 
you know yeah. I'm very critical of Kaz. <laughs> um, but fine. um I think what Kaz did was was uncover what the players were feeling. And they weren't given a voice in the Japanese mm -hmm. literature. When yeah. you go back and read the stuff that I've read for the um the, the the beginning of the pro league it, it's written by the owners it's written by the newspapers that are behind the new league so it basically does not take the player's perspective it talks about how great the uh all americans are and, and how the japanese yeah. have that as a goal but you're right it doesn't say okay how did the players who were getting their butts kicked actually feel and, yeah. and i think that's a really wonderful insight that i'm yeah. realizing for the first time tonight okay good yeah. good Hey, you know, one thing I did want to add is that it also pointed out where there might have been misunderstandings, too. And Rob, through a conversation that we had, uh, Kaz goes on quite a bit about Lou Gehrig. Uh, very critical of Lou Gehrig uh, in his interactions with the Japanese uh, for a couple of reasons. One, Lou showed up with this expectation of this samurai spirit being present in all these ball players, And they were being, you know, uh, ridiculed in the way that they were playing in a way that, you know, that nervous kind of laugh when you're embarrassed, they were laughing as they were running the bases. And that really pissed Lou Gehrig off. And so he made a comment about that in the final dinner. And, and all the Japanese, as uh, Kaz was saying, they were shocked that he would be critical of, and make that comment in public. So that was ding number one against Lou Gehrig. Number two is he gets hit by a pitch in his hand in Japan, and he sits the entire tour out after that. And automatically, they think this guy is, uh, he's trying to protect himself so that he can go save that record over in the U.S., uh, which, from their perspective, that's what it looked like. But, and Rob, you pointed out to me that Lou Gehrig was actually pretty hurt. Uh, they took x-rays of his hand. He almost didn't go through spring training the following year. He just barely recovered. So I don't think they really fully understood the extent of how injured he was. Uh, his record actually probably could have ended and he couldn't have played. He wasn't physically able to compete. So it's kind of a, a mix of, you can see where misunderstandings may have taken place. Hey, and there's a, a really interesting misunderstanding uh, with regards to Zenimura and the Royal Giants. So Lon Goodwin uh, tells Zenny that he's taken over the LA White Sox. And so he's thinking it's that's the team they're going to play over there. But it's the Royal Giants. So, again, it's these better players that really enhance the team. But uh, Zenny doesn't know that. And so they're being interviewed by Japanese press. And Zenny says, oh, yeah, we beat them three times over in the U.S. We feel very confident. And that really upsets Biz Mackey and some of the players. Like, we've never played them. We, you know, he's basically lying. Uh, so I think, and I mentioned this in the essay that I wrote about the birth of the tour, that Biz Mackey played angry that day. So that's when he hit that first home run. And I think he was like a double or maybe a single shy of the cycle. Uh, he just tore it up. And uh, so there was that, that misunderstanding from that perspective as well. Uh, and that was verified by Kyoko Yoshido, who got a copy in, in the Japanese press of all the players that Lon Goodwin said who were going to go. And it was basically all of the Negro League stars, as I had mentioned earlier, Turkey Stearns and, and Bullet Joe Rogan and, and all the great players who were on that Royal Giants California Winter League team. So anyway, a lot of misunderstandings and things getting lost in translation, if you will, uh, over in Japan. Well, um, you mentioned the importance of getting the different perspectives. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Phil Dixon and the work he does and, and the other historians that are working yeah. to document uh, the Negro Leagues, which, you know, I, I know that's more, you know, it's a no, after that's the fact yeah. job. Yeah. So I, I'll share what I know. Uh, I don't know Phil personally, but I know that he's a very important figure when it comes to uh, the his, historical research. I think he may have been uh, one of the original founders of, founders of the Negro League Baseball Museum. Uh, I don't know what happened with those relationships, but uh, he's done a lot of uh, archiving as well. He owns an extensive photography collection, uh, which is why Cos hunted him down. Uh, he, he's a very important voice when it comes to uh, Negro League history. Um, and, and actually, this was one of the interesting insights for me as well. 
Uh, it, and this is kind of a little humorous side, but at least it was to me. Uh, you guys familiar with the movie uh, Christmas Story? Where the kid gets the decoder ring and he works really hard and he, and he gets it, uh, he, he decodes it and it says, drink more Ovaltine. And he goes, oh man, commercial. Like he's very you know, disappointed after all that hard work. So I'm working on this translation project with this whole team and I get to the very end and Phil Dixon tells Kaz, we need fewer white guys working on Negro League history projects. <laughs> Drink more Ovaltine moment. So one, I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, two, I also put it in, uh, in, it, in its perspective from history as well. He was talking about 1985 uh, and I think it was a different dynamic then. Um, and I've got my own personal reasons and you've met my family virtually, at least what I shared. I think intent is very important as well. I think in 1985, there may have been a lot of people trying to uh, take advantage financially of some of the, the history and the archives and the memorabilia and things like that. So I think he may have been referring to that. But I do think it's important, you know, from the other side is that uh, as an African-American male, he's gonna have shared experiences that he can relate to and articulate that I personally can't. But I, that's the same thing with me and my son. Uh, you know, when he goes out in the world, he has a different experience than I do. So, um, but what, you know, the work that I did on Zenimura, this is the quote I go back to. Uh, it's actually Alice Walker, African-American author. Uh, she may write about the African-American experience, but she's really talking about the shared human uh, experience as well. And so that's what I feel like I'm, relating to uh, when I find these stories and I, I think it's important to preserve them, make them more accurate for history and to kind of dedicate my time to them. So that's yeah. what keeps going. Well said, well said. And, and drink and, more herbal tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well said. And, and I'm, you know, it, and it's, you do a great job and, and hopefully and that can encourage others um, yeah. to do more, you know, and someone's got to yeah. do it. So I'm, I'm glad you yeah. are. Uh, Mark Cantor has a question. Hey, Mark. Am I? Uh, how are you? Good, thanks. Can I just tell you? Uh, I'm a. Um, I do know John 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 Holloway. Okay. And, and uh, can I just say that um, sometimes you have to take his research with a grain of salt. Sure. You got to take every. Every I know, but so, yeah. John has, I don't know, I've been, I've been in Sabre a long, a long time, okay. and there's been some questions, that's okay. all, about, about John. I love John, don't, 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 yeah. don't get me wrong. I'm just saying <laughs> that his research, he might have embellished some things over, over the years. Sure. That's all. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I don't know John myself. I only know of his work, uh, but I'll defend him in that they came around at a certain time where they were fortunate enough to interview the players themselves. And since yeah. the players' memories really weren't that good. So I think in some cases there was a kernel of truth uh, and they kind of captured that kernel. But now that our, our generation, we have access to better digital archives, newspapers being more accessible, we're the validators. We're coming up behind them and saying, okay, there was a kernel of truth, but really what's what actually happened there? So that's, I kind of use it as clues uh, and then we go forward and verify it or debunk it. So, and I see some, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And probably Rob, is that maybe uh, a criticism you might have with Kaz and some of the work he did? Yeah, yeah, Bill. I mean, I mean that's exactly right. Since I'm, I'm constantly going back through his work, and I yeah. find major mistakes. But here I am, 20, 30 years later, with with Baseball Reference and Newspapers.com. I mean, I have every single genealogical database available at my yeah. fingertips. I can check his facts in seconds. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all sorts of problems, right? <laughs> but but he didn't have that. He would have had to yeah. go to that small town. So yeah, we yeah. really are you know, midgets on the shoulders of giants in a way. Yeah. And we yeah. have such benefits. 
it's just important as research, and I know we agree on this, is that we're open and that the older people are open to our well-meaning criticisms too. It's like, yeah. if we find something, hey, you know what? Sorry, guy, but you were wrong. You know, we have to say, all right, you know, it's not personal. It's it's yeah, yeah. facts. And, and as you point out when I'm wrong, yeah, it's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the what the the unexamined baseball history fact is not worth believing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we have <laughs> things to talk about. <laughs> sure. Hey, and by the way, uh, when we translated Kaz's original '85 book, we left the mistakes in, and then we put a little footnote next to it, saying, "Hey, he said this. However, we this is what we discovered." Um, so I felt it was important to try to stay as authentic as possible. Um, so. I actually got the impression that he wanted me to maybe uh, take it in a different direction uh, and like maybe clean it up even more and make it more polished. Uh, but I don't think that was my role because I think there would have been a lot of questions about the integrity of what he said versus how I maybe pushed it too far. So I think I'm phase two of maybe a, a, for a phase future phase three for somebody else to take it and do something with it, something bigger. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm excited to share that a few different companies, if you will, uh, in, in the film space have expressed an interest in it. So documentaries, maybe a movie, maybe a mini series, of, like somewhat Netflix or something. But I think there could be a lot of interest right now, especially with the world we're in and some of the dynamics we're having to deal with. So, you know, we, we talk about these ballplayers being treated like second class citizens in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, but man, <laughs> here we are again <laughs> in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Hey, go ahead, Mark. If you're talking about a mini series or whatever, uh, I have an acquaintance of mine. You might know him, a fellow named Mike 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 so Sokolov. Okay. And Mike's read, Mike's written a lot of uh, sports, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of books, and um, okay. he. One of his one of his books was called Drama, Drama High about about my uh, high school. Okay. And we went to high high school outside of Philly in in the seventies, nice. and that and that be, that essentially became a uh, a, a TV show a thir a thirteen week show on NBC, okay. of of a few years ago. But but you but you can look look him up. He's a um, he's he's a writer. Mike Mike's a sports a, mostly a sports writer for the uh, New York Times and the Post. Okay. Mike, Mike. so you might again? want Sok Sokolov. Okay. S O K O L V E. Okay. He lives in Sil Silver Springs or uh, Bethesda, Mar Mar Maryland. Okay, great. Thank you. I would love to see, like, it'd be such a great historical timepiece, you know, to, yeah. to see. I mean, all of us baseball dorks on the call here we'd love to see them in the old uniforms all that but then like to see you know try to recreate japan and and uh, you know the time and, and being on yeah. the network, that'd be such a cool be yeah. uh, uh, an ambitious hey, production it, effort but <laughs> it, it would be hey if i could add um uh, did we all see the catcher who was a spy paul russ yes, uh, okay yeah so there was a a, a japanese official who he developed a relationship with at some point in the movie. Um, that individual was in my presentation. He was the one Lou Gehrig had his uh, arm around. Mm -hmm. So that was Takizo Matsumoto. He's a Hall of Famer in Japan now. Uh, he's been recognized for all the work he did from the Japanese side for all the, uh, the Goodwill tour bridge building, if you will. So cool. anyway, just a whole time period. I just wanted to point that out that he was a pretty important figure. He actually graduated from Fresno High School in 1919, then moved over to Japan uh, and played an important role with a lot of the Olympic Games. He was supposed to be the head of the uh, Olympic Games in 1940, uh, but it was canceled. But he had a pretty important role behind the scenes with a lot of the tours. Interesting. Yeah, they did a good job with that movie. I love that book too. Um, yeah. And the so you have Japanese Hall of Famers and photos. So they, uh, I forget his name, but the guy on the cover of your book. So is he the one that became the manager and then brought the, the two black players to play for the Braves? He did, yeah. So Shinji Hamasaki. Uh, apparently there is a biography on him over in Japan. Uh, 
I really prefer not to go through the translation process again. <laughs> One I would like to read. Uh, my understanding is that he specifically said, um, well, he wanted black ball players on his team. Uh, he toured the U.S. in 1928 after this 27 tour with uh, Keo, I believe. And uh, they played against uh, historically black colleges and universities. So he had a great experience in the U.S. interacting with black players as well. So some of the first black ball players, they run his team. Um, again, again, I think the quote, and I'm paraphrasing, that he said he was going to quit as a manager if, if they made him get rid of the African-American players on his team. So he, he felt uh, a strong commitment uh, having them on his ball team. And when, when he brought them over, was that when they first started to formally allow import players and he went straight to the to get Negro Leagues players? Uh, my understanding is that it was some sort of uh, relationship with uh, maybe Bill Veck and Abe Saperstein. I don't have a full, yeah, Rob said yes. So yeah, some of those players might have been on loan. Uh, but yeah, those were the first kind of more official after uh, uh, Jimmy Bonner. Yeah. In 36. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Eric's got a question. Hey, Bill. Um, yeah. I, I butcher the, uh, the name of the league, but in the book, you talked about a, a league, I guess that was based in Berkeley um, mm -hmm. or around Berkeley. That was kind of the, the first integrated league, really. Um, yeah. Can you just talk about, I guess, how that came about and, uh, and it really was yeah. groundbreaking, I guess, for its time? Yeah, that's interesting. So that's actually Ralph's area of expertise. It's called the Berkeley Colored League. Uh, and it was a multicultural league in Northern California, Berkeley, Oakland, that area. Um, uh, Rob, you actually know uh, one of the one of the relatives of one of the ball players. We interact with him quite a bit in social media. Uh, Ron, author, yeah. Uh, so his great uncle played in those leagues as well. So it's a very important uh, league uh, from a multicultural international perspective, if you will, uh, in Northern California. Uh, but it's really not the only one or the first one. Uh, all up and down the coast, uh, we actually identified a Negro, Negro League team in, uh, where was, well, definitely LA. You, you've got the LA Trilbies, I believe they were called, in like the 1890s or so. Uh, then in uh, San Diego, there's some teams early 1900s. Uh, and then that was kind of the foundation for the California Winter League as well, having those black teams there, the LA Giants. Uh, Bill Pettis uh, was a pretty famous Negro League uh, ball player, played there in California, competed against uh, one of the teams that Rob wrote about uh, in early, uh, I think 1909, in Japanese American team. So, yeah, a lot of interaction between uh, Japanese ball players and Negro League ball players on the West Coast. So it is yeah, kind of that Harry Kono, uh, Kono signed Jimmy Bonner in Northern California. Yeah, I was, Eric, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I really like that section too. And I actually uh, sent, um, took a picture of that section and sent it to a couple different people who I know who live in the East Bay in Berkeley and Oakland that would be really into it. And they both got a kick out of it. And seeing, I, I guess you're saying it was not necessarily rare, but it does seem like a very Berkeley thing uh, yeah, which I'm proud to say. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Hey, uh, can I just mention a few other names of players I took notes of that I thought the group might find of interest? Yeah, please. Uh, a young pitcher in Hawaii named Bozo Wakabayashi. Um, he pitched for the Honolulu Asahi. Uh, there's a famous picture, it's actually in the book, of um, the Philadelphia Royal Giants holding a, a trophy cup that was against the Honolulu Asahi. And uh, Bozo, uh, I think his first name is uh, Henry Tadashi, Wakabayashi. Uh, he was just a relief pitcher in that game. But he's in the Hall of Fame now in Japan, played for the Hanshin Tigers. And uh, this is the, the bit of trivia that I like about uh, him, is that he wore the number 18. And my understanding is that the ace of a pitcher now on a Japanese team will wear number 18 in honor of Bozo. So anybody know that story? Anybody want to fact check me on that? Yeah. yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, it's in honor of uh, Salamura, I think. You sure? 
sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's look it up. All right. Trevor, you got it. I was actually, this came up recently and, uh, and, and Coop who's on the call is maybe going to write an article about it and look into it, see if you can figure it out. So if anyone has any ideas, is it seems like it's definitely a thing that aces wear 18. Um, and like when Japanese players have come over yeah. to the U S they, they make a point of wearing it. Some of them wore and, number uh, 11, according um, to Trevor. But it seems to be in the English language, there's not much definitive out there that explains what yeah. the actual origin was and, and how it became a league wide thing as opposed to um, just a team specific thing. Um, so, if anyone has anything on that, let us know. We'd be curious. Okay. It'd be an interesting article. Look at, look at the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let me check my notes here. Uh, Frank Duncan uh, played for the Kansas City Monarchs. He was Jackie Robin. He was part of the tour. Uh, he was a first baseman and a catcher. Uh, he was Jackie Robinson's coach uh, when Jackie played for the Monarchs in 45. Uh, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Jackie Robinson hit his last home run in Japan. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. I was in trouble finding the button. Yes, he did. Okay. And played, of course, his last game, last run, and last hit in Japan. Yeah, great. Although I did find Jackie Robinson throwing out the first pitch in the 1958 Negro League All-Star Game, East-West Classic. And the starting pitcher after he threw out the first pitch was Charlie Pride, who was just recognized with the Country Music Lifetime Achievement Award. Wow. So how's that? Wow. <laughs> you can visit my blog, zenandmirror.com, and learn about Charlie Pride's uh, game and relationship with Jackie Robinson. Okay. I deviated a little bit from uh, the Japanese baseball, but uh, Jackie, uh, excuse me, Charlie Pride is an international country music sensation. So it seemed appropriate to include that. All right. Well, cool. any, anyone else have questions out there before we wrap it up? Um, if not, maybe just a few final notes. So I mentioned the potential film projects. And by the way, those are just conversations. If anybody would like to engage in more conversations, we'd love to make something happen. Hey, before you get Rob, Rob figured out the raise hand feature. Oh, do you know, oh, <laughs> is this the number 18 thing? No, here I am dominating the conversation. I'm sorry, but still no, it's fine. So we've talked about this on the internet or on um, emails back and forth. But what are your thoughts for public consumption on the myths surrounding the Royal Giants and all the false information? I was told sure. by a very prominent member, you'll know who I'm talking about without mentioning his name, that the Negro Giants professionalized Japanese baseball. I was told this or read this last week. And of course, we know okay. about the emperor meeting them. And so do you yeah. want to talk about that at all? Sure. Uh, I kind of feel like I already addressed it with the one slide about the timing and how people uh, are maybe taking snippets of causes uh, statements and taking them out of context. If you put them back in the context, professional baseball was able to come about when it did because of the Royal Giants and their influence in 1936. So again, to me, it's more about the timing. He says eventually he follows it up that it would have come yes. along. So to me, that's, that's pretty clear. We, we've ironed that wrinkle. Right. Uh, the next wrinkle is, did the Royal Giants visit the Emperor's Palace? Were they greeted by him? Did he give them a, a five-year major league et cetera? Um, average annual salary of four. Trying to figure out uh, uh, I can hear somebody speaking. If you can mute your phone. There we go. Thank you. Um, so I think what happens in this situation is it's probably legend and lore, three different stories kind of being twisted up and becoming a rope, and we have to unravel it. So one, Rap Dixon was recognized for a great accomplishment over there. At the time, Koshian uh, had the furthest outfield. Again, it was 420 feet. Nobody had ever hit the ball out of that ballpark. Uh, he did not hit the ball out of the ballpark. He actually hit a line drive triple 
off the wall. And after that, they painted a white spot on the wall. And that was the recognition for what was a great hit at the time, the longest ball ever hit in Koshian. So yes, Rap Dixon was recognized for great athletic achievement. Uh, did they visit the Emperor's Palace? Lon Goodwin says that they did visit in his 1927 letter that he wrote. Uh, and actually a biography that one of his ball players, Alfred Bland, wrote about him. It's in the appendices. He says that they were greeted and welcomed at the Emperor's Palace. Now, was it the Emperor that welcomed them? We don't know. We don't have a photograph. But there was some event or occasion that took place at the Emperor's Palace. And then the third thing is the famous photograph of the trophy with the Honolulu Asahi. I think when you take those three things, Rap Dixon, the Emperor, and the trophy, it somehow has become Rap Dixon received the trophy from the Emperor at the palace. So that's all I can validate with what I know. And again, that's what we kind of do is we find the kernels and try to find the truth. So having said that, uh, I think um, the person who we're speaking of shared this visual of Rap Dixon with a trophy in a coloring book for small children or elementary school children so that they can learn the story about black ball players in Japan. To me, I think that's kind of like George Washington chopping down a cherry tree, that we need to pick our battles. And I think that's appropriate for that audience. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, cool. Well, thank you. I mean, that was, I learned so much there. And, oh, yeah. And, we went to full nine. I think we're good. Yeah. yeah. I think we're Rob, full. Rob, thanks yeah. for all your input, too. I'm, I'm glad you're able to parlay your one Zoom call to the next. So thanks for yeah. joining us. Um, so, yeah, Bill, thanks so much for, jo for, for doing that and for all your effort not only on this call, but just in your research in general and sharing it with the baseball world. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been uh, a joy. Thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. And Ralph, yes. thanks for your contributions. And Ralph, thanks for contributing to the book. Yes, right. Ralph, thanks. Uh, yeah, ditto to you on, on what I said to Bill. And, uh, and he's saying thanks in the chat. At least he figured that part out. <laughs> we get there. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. So everyone, yeah, you're welcome to, to sign off. Um, hopefully we'll see you all December 3rd. Um, for our last one, hopefully we get a good turnout. So hope to see a lot, all of you and, and encourage anyone else that you think might be interested to watch the movie and join us. Um, and so we'll, we'll sign off for now. I'll, we'll, I'll stay on actually, I should say for a few minutes, everyone wants to chat, but other, otherwise, uh, good night to everyone. Thanks for joining us. And, and thanks again, Bill.